Gary, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me on. I want to start by taking it way back in the sense of just, you know, who is Gary Falkowitz? What, you know, what, almost like the childhood, you know, in terms of like, what are some of the things that shaped the, the person that you are today? My dad owned a candy store, right? So a retail business owner. Uh, my mom was a teacher. Two really important facets of my life were about no shortcuts, right? My mom would not let me take any shortcuts. Here was the homework. Here was the test. You had to study. And then from my father, it was this persona of making sure everyone around him was happy and smiling and the customer's always right perspective. And uh, I guess they both had a real lasting effect on me, an impact on me, which I didn't realize until if you fast forward many years later, I decided to become an entrepreneur like yourself, where you start to bet on certain things. So that's who I am. And uh, it's a lot of fun, man. So then kind of going off that, because you had almost like an interesting trajectory, even even as a lawyer. I'm curious, like what what compel you to go to law school and then that path? Right. Because there's, you know, there's the public sector, the private sector and then, you know, and then beyond. I'm just curious if you can kind of share some of that journey. You know, you always have the parents who tell you, oh, you love to argue you're going to be a lawyer one day. You should be a lawyer. And that was definitely something I had from my parents and my grandparents. I didn't really take it to heart when we were younger. If you didn't know what you wanted to do you said, okay, I'll just go to law school. And that's where I really fell into it. I didn't know that I was going to become a lawyer or even a businessman at that point. Um, When I got to law school, still had no idea. I became friendly with a professor that taught trial law. And he was actually the district attorney of Kings County of Brooklyn, New York. And it was my favorite class in law school. And he said, Gary, why don't you come in for an interview? would love to have you join the team of about 250 assistant district attorneys. Again, still having no idea what I wanted to do in my life or in the future. I said, sure, sounds great. One thing led to the next. I became an assistant district attorney and I became very uh, a confident speaker. Right When you have to speak with a judge uh, in a courtroom and there's a defendant and there are witnesses and you have to question folks and you have to think on your feet. um, If you do it well enough, the confidence begins to increase significantly. I realized after doing that for a few years while I liked it, it wasn't a path to the success that I wanted. I wanted more. I kept seeing uh, or hearing about success stories on the civil side of things, not the criminal side of things. So I took a leap. Within a couple of weeks of starting at a personal injury law firm, I realized it was a business. And I realized that I may have been the only one other than the named partner in the firm who knew that. Everyone else was just sort of clocking in, clocking out, servicing, working a lot of hours, don't get me wrong, but they were being lawyers and they weren't thinking about the business side of things. And a light bulb just went off in my head and all of a sudden ideas and opportunities and opinions began to form. And here I am today, you know, on the other side of things. So, so I want to ask you about that. Like, what was it that led to that realization that, hey, this is a business? Because there's, I mean, there's a lot of lawyers, I mean, that, that will go their entire careers without making that realization and you make it in a few weeks. So it was at Parker Wakeman, okay, New York national law firm. They spent millions on marketing, right? For those who don't know or are new to the industry, in the personal injury world, it's a contingency fee mapping or model, I should say. And the law firms only get paid if they're successful and they had to gamble a lot and it took years sometimes for cases to resolve for a fee. So when I got to the office and I realized there was an intake department, there was a settlement department, there was a marketing department and all the money that was flowing out and then learning about what had to happen to, from a lead to become a client, to become a a settled client, to become someone that made some money and the firm made some money, it dawned on me that, first of all, the margins could be tremendous. And then second of all, that there were so many leaks and so much space where not only that law firm, because they were really good at what they did, but that law firm and every other law firm, they were just missing it. And I remember very clearly Walking into my boss's office, I had to schedule a meeting, right? Five minutes, yeah, five minutes for me. I was still there for only a few weeks and I thanked him for the opportunity. And then I said to him, by the way, if there's ever an opportunity for me to be involved in the business side of the firm, I'd love that. 
And he kind of said to me, that's great, Gary. Thanks so much. Now, please go back to your office and do what I'm paying you to do. Right. And and that was it. And I, I continued to be a personal injury attorney and talk to a lot of clients all day long. And about a year and a half later, the managing attorney of the intake opened up and they offered it to me. And I just ran. I sprinted with it. I learned as much as I can. I remember sitting down my first day with that title with an intake specialist and just listening, to, just just watching and learning. Hey, what are you doing? What are the conversations like? What's your scripting like? What is your goal here? And I've been a sponge ever since. So then on, on that note, on intake, I mean, you're clearly quite passionate about it. I mean, you you go all around the country consulting with firms on intake. You wrote a book on intake. And, and you know, many times if, if someone's talking about intake in the legal industry, your name comes up. How do you get so obsessed with, with intake in particular? <laughs> if you asked me in law school, I'd have no idea what you were talking about right now. I have a knack and a passion for wanting to find the inefficiencies and then wanting to find the solutions. And Intake to me was one of those glaring inefficiencies um, where law firms started making decisions unilaterally about how to handle their leads. And that would have a significant impact. When you started to hear about what some of these cases could be worth and how much it cost for the law firm to acquire just that lead, it was head scratching for me to understand why law firms gave up so quickly. Why did we give up on a lead if they reached out to us, I always, whenever I talk to a law firm, I always say, here you are a law firm f- uh, marketing for this type of client. And then this type of client, exactly the one you're marketing for reaches out to you. Why are we not signing 100% of those? How is it possible we're not signing 100% of the people that meet our criteria and reach out to us? And yet here we are living in the world, in our industry, where on average, more than 40% of the people that we want that reach out to us. Don't sign with us. It's crazy. So, so I want to dig into that because if, if you speak to a lot of law firm owners, they'll say, you know, that they sign a hundred percent of the cases that they want. So, wh- where is the disparity? Yeah, yeah, it's. it's uh, I've heard that many times. Respectfully, I don't think they're um, very much on top of what's going on at the front end of their business. I think they're getting certain metrics shared with them. I think they're signing cases. I think they're making a lot of money. And for many people, that's good enough. They don't want to know the analogy. They don't want to know how much they weigh. So they're not going on the scale. Mm-hmm. All they know is that they're getting up in the morning, they're, they're exercising and things are going great. And that's good enough. The reality is when you start to dig in, when you start to open up the hood and you realize that maybe you quit too soon on your follow-up, or maybe you had people who called you, but you missed their call, or maybe a claimant reached out to another law firm and now your metrics don't consider the fact that a lead reached out to you, went elsewhere, but because you aren't fast enough or because you didn't ask the right questions or because your staff didn't convey the the appropriate communication um, that you lost that case, they're going to put that to the side. That's not a wanted case, you know, however they want to define it. So I think it's a matter of people looking in the mirror, right? Every successful business owner really does want to know where are my inefficiencies? Where are my problems? How can I fix that? And I think if the law firms that I've met with, that I've worked with, are the ones that are honest with themselves. Um, and I've had many law firms reach out to me and say, Gary, I think I'm doing a great job. I think I'm doing an excellent job, but I want to bring you in to confirm that for me. I love that. That's great. Let me come in there. And let me see if I get, let me see if you're right. And if you're right, I'm going to shake your hand and say, excellent job. Keep doing what you're doing. But if you're wrong, the opportunity cost is tremendous, right? Because now you're looking at the potential of an increase of what, 5, 10, 15% more signed cases. So I'd look at it just as these are lawyers that, again, Michael, they didn't go to business school. I didn't go to business school either. And they were taught to provide a service that was needed. And they were never taught how to run a business. They're improvising that. We're all improvising that. And they're sort of a couple steps behind because they're lawyers first and they're businessmen or businesswomen second. And and from your experience, I mean, particularly on the on the intake front, where where do you find are the greatest drop off points, the greatest friction points? Like where where are the where really the the pain points that happen that, you know, in some cases, I guess, firm owners know about. But in many cases, like they don't even know that this is happening and this is, you know, should be concerning for them. Yeah, I think it's something that we, we're not really talking about a lot right now. Um, there are a few, a few points that stand out for me. Uh, one is um, abandonment rate. 
I think that on average, law firms are losing up to 10%, sometimes more, of their leads because they don't pick up the phones timely. And I'm, I'm talking about all hours of the day, whether it's nine to five, whether it's 11 o'clock at night, whether it's 8 a.m. Sunday morning. Um, and I think right now we're in a state where law firms are still trying to figure out. They're like, it's almost like they're running around. How do I do this? How do I, okay, this weekend you're on call. Okay, this weekend I got, I got the call center, but if, but if it's a good case, you have to be on call. Okay, if a web lead comes in, you got to make sure you find somebody. If you're on vacation, find someone else. And it's, it's still happening for some of the most successful personal injury law firms you know, out there that it's not this consistent, uh, reliable approach that they're using. That is a major uh, issue in the industry. Another major issue from an intake standpoint is we give up too soon. Whether we're not, not responding fast enough or not uh, um, following up for a long enough period of time. I like to use this example. If I have to go to the gym, and I do, I'm a little bit overweight. I got to get back in shape. But if I wanted to go to the gym and there's a gym down the block from me, and I walk into that gym and I check out the equipment and I get to know their employees and I feel really good about it. And I walk out of that gym because I haven't signed anything yet. I still need that gym. I still need a gym membership even after I leave. So how dare that gym not follow up with me? Just because I left and I wasn't prepared to sign doesn't mean I don't need a gym anymore. It just means I wasn't ready at that moment. And if you're a good salesperson, if you're a good intake person, you're going to do an excellent job at conveying persuasive communication as to how you can help. You're going to follow up me. You're going to text me. You're going to call me. You're going to say we could still help. You're going to tell me what the deal is, what the benefits are. And if, as a gym, if you said, ah, that guy doesn't want the gym. No, no, that guy, he can use the gym and he can he should use our gym. And let's make sure he knows that. And I think sometimes we forget about that. If someone needs a personal injury lawyer, they need you whether they sign on the first day or the seventh day. And so I, I want to dig into each of those because I know the first one you mentioned with abandonment rate. So if someone's hearing, okay, they're just not picking up the phone, but it could, it could be even more than that. I, I guess like how many times on average does the phone ring, right? Cause, cause you could pick it up after what, 10 rings or you could pick it up after one ring and you know, you can, you can have abandonment, right? Yeah. So there's the abandonment where the caller just leaves, just hangs up, right? And now you have this missed call. It's another term that we're probably used to, a missed call, 10%. And that's what I meant before by abandonment rate, about 10% of all inbound calls are missed completely. Another 10% aren't picked up for at least 30 seconds. I mean, I don't know about you. I don't remember the last time I waited 30 seconds for someone to pick up. It was likely an emergency. It was likely my son, actually. I probably would wait for my one of my kids to pick up going, why aren't they picking up? I'm going to keep ringing them, right? But other than that, I'm hanging up. I'm finding another restaurant. I'm finding another law firm. I'm going to find an alternative, especially in this competitive age, but that's neither here nor there at the moment. But I, so it's, it, it bothers me that that's 20% of our inbound phone calls that we're not treating with the appropriate response and therefore are leaving obviously potentially a significant amount of money on the table. Man. And then uh, on the note of giving up too soon with follow up, I know you've got several stories of this in, in terms of, I mean, e even with, with ICE, what you guys were doing with the call center, would uh, people were saying, hey, just give us, give us your so called in quotes like dead leads. And what, what are some examples of a follow up where someone said, hey, this has been dead for weeks and there, you know, there's nothing here. And yet, you know, you would recapture them. I mean, sometimes months, Michael, really, or even over a year. Um, I remember we had this one really fun project when we started ICE, which is short for Intake Conversion Experts. It was a call center that my partners and I created focusing on retention. And I remember early on in the business, we were looking for any way to generate revenue right, and, and to provide uh, value. One law firm said to us, and I forgot which mass tort it was, but it was one of these mass torts. And they said, hey, Gary, we have leads. It must have been October, October of 2017. They said to us, we have about a thousand leads from 2016 that we'll give to you and we'll only pay you if you sign anything that qualifies. So, you know, we're desperate. I know how bad intake is generally. I said, I'll take on this bet. This is a great bet for us. They give us a thousand leads. We signed over 200 of them. These are more than nine months old. It was October of 17 and there were six 2016 leads. So that obviously became a client for life. But the point is, that these are viable leads. You have to understand in society, you know, we're on one side of the table. We're on the side of the table. We're marketing and we speak with clients or potential leads all day long. But on the other side of the table, 
is a claimant that never needed a personal injury lawyer in their lives. So they're hesitant, right? There are challenges. It's, it's very courageous for them to pick up that phone call and actually call a lawyer. They think they're going to get screwed. Unfortunately, our reputation, us being the lawyers, is not so great. So they're looking for every way to walk away. They're looking for every way to say, you know what, forget this. I, I don't need a lawyer. And then they, whether they're on vacation or their kids get sick or their parents get sick, whatever distraction occurs, they forget about it because hiring a lawyer isn't a true priority for them as much as it is for the lawyer. Let's, let's sign them up. Let's sign them up. Let's sign them up. So when you have claimants who are so quickly and easily able to just put this to the side, there's still value out there. And you have to communicate your interest in helping them. And I think if you do that effectively, you're talking about maximizing res- re- revenue and maximizing value. There's going to be firms that, you know, they'll just say, hey, we need more leads. And you're looking at you know, potentially a, a thousand plus so-called like dead leads. I guess, what are your thoughts on that? Because the money that could have been invested in, in acquiring more leads versus simply having the proper intake to leverage the existing ones. Um, it's funny. You, you hear a lot of law firms say that we have a, a lead problem, right? That they're going to, we have to just keep uh, spending more money because the marketing isn't working. They're looking at it from the wrong lens for two reasons. Number one, they have to squeeze the towel dry. And too often, they're throwing away a wet towel uh, when there's still a lot of liquid left in that towel. They have to make damn well sure that if they're going to say, I'm no longer following up with this lead, that they tried everything, that they texted multiple times, they called multiple times, they had a lawyer call and leave a voicemail. I remember sitting at as, as a managing attorney at Parker's office telling my intake team, hey, when we reach at that time, it must have been 30 days. When we reach 30 days of no response for someone who qualified, I want you to send me, I want an email. We had an automatic email come out to me so that I can leave a voicemail and say, not that I'm any better than them, by the way, Michael, because I'm not. They were better salespeople than I am. But I had a a title, right? So I get to call these folks up and say, hi, this is Gary Falkowitz. I'm an attorney at the law firm. I know that you you once were interested in our services and and right now we can't get in touch with you. I just want to let you know that I think we can still help. And if you want us to, here's my direct line. I can't tell you how many times somebody called me back that same day. They were 30 days silent, but they heard an attorney's voice and they called back five minutes later. Um, so that's one, one way in which I want law firms to be aware of it. And then the second one is this. Yes, I understand how valuable a signed client is, but how valuable is an advocate? How valuable is a lead that you couldn't help, but becomes an advocate of yours? I don't know about you, but I get texts from group. I'm in like, let's call it five different group texts. Maybe it's more, maybe it's less. Who knows? How often? Once a week, does somebody say the following question? Hey, does somebody have a good, and fill in the blank, painter, electrician, lawyer, right? And here we are recommending somebody. I've recommended painters that I don't even remember using, but they're in my phone and I'm trying to be nice and help my, my neighbors or my friends. Same thing goes for your lawyer. So if you leave them off, with a strong impression, whether you can help them or not, you might be creating an advocate who becomes a marketer for you. And and there was a word that you used when we were talking about intake and you're saying, you know, sales and salespeople. And I think sometimes people would, might hear that and think, well, what do you mean sales? And like, uh, you know, they kind of have an aversion to the word. Uh, what, what are your thoughts in, in regards to like the importance of you know, being really like trained on sales that relates to intake? I was one of those people. I had an aversion to the term sales uh, early on and for quite some time, actually. What I, the conclusion I came to there is that the industry has become saturated. With saturation comes deep competition. With deep competition requires sales skills. You need to be able to sell your services effectively, even to those folks that reach out to you. Now, this is not outbound sales. This is not cold calling sales. We can't do that. But if somebody calls up, Another word for sales in our industry is reassurance. What type of reassurance are you giving them? This is someone who called up and said, hey, I saw your commercial. I was in an accident. I had to go to the hospital. Can you help me? Well, how we answer that question might dictate whether this person becomes a client or not. If we go, oh, yeah, we can help. And it stops here. We start asking some simple questions. I have not been persuaded that you're the right firm for me. I have three others I can call like this. But if I can go, 
Well, Mrs. Johnson, I am so sorry to hear about what happened. We handle car accident cases with injuries like yours every single day. Of course we can help. First of all, tell me how you're feeling. Whoa, this person cares about me. And they provided reassurance. And they told me that, you know, they're going to ask some pieces of information from me that's going to help them. So I think it's really important that we train our team to understand that there is some sales to this because you're not the only game in town. You know, I like to, in thinking about this podcast, um, I kept coming back to this idea that lawyers think of themselves often, not every lawyer, as that old school lawyer in the age where there's only one lawyer in the neighborhood and he's right down the block and he's got that that corner location with the uh, with the hanging you know sign. It's not like that anymore. I mean, you see the commercials. Thirty percent of the commercials, I'm making that number up, but it seems like it are about personal injury lawyers, and, and I think. We need to appreciate that we are just a commodity. And if we don't respond appropriately, I mean, both in time and in quality, then we're, we lose. And, and you're a sports guy like me, Michael. I hate losing, right? And when it's my fault, when I lose because it's my fault, that's the worst feeling in the world, especially when it's due to lack of preparation. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, and, and speaking of which, you know, when we talk about where a lot of firms are losing, particularly on the intake front, uh, I guess if you could speak to the importance of really being 24-7, 365, because you know, calls come in at, at really at any hour, I mean, not always during business hours. So I probably listen to just thousands of phone calls on behalf of law firms nationwide. I can tell you firsthand, you cannot predict when a potential claimant is going to call you. Quite often, you'll get them at the scene of the, they will call at the scene of the accident. They will literally call, hey, I just got to an accident. The police are on their way. My shoulder is killing me right now. Is this? Did I do the right thing by calling you? Remember, this is for 99% of the people in this world, A, they'll never need a personal injury lawyer. And the other 1% that do may only need it once in their lives, right? So they've never had this conversation before. You'll get these calls 24-7. You know, if anyone thinks that this is a nine to five business, I'm, I'm telling you, they're, they're setting themselves up for failure. When you're creating a law firm, you must be open 24-7. When you go to your website, it should never say closed. It should never say Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. It is open 24-7, which is why we have solutions 24-7. And I'm not saying about having your people, hey, I need you to work tonight from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Please don't sleep, right? That's obviously unreasonable. And, and I understand that there are, listen, I have an outsourced option, right? We created ICE which is uh, an outsourced solution for inbound phone calls. I think that this is a problem in the industry right now. I think we have to start digging a little bit deeper about how important response time is, regardless of the day, regardless of the time. I'm getting very frustrated with our industry right now that we think we have the luxury of time. And I want everyone who's listening to this, regardless of what industry you're in or what type of law firm you own. The first step to success is an immediate response time. If you cannot be fast in your response time, you're starting behind the eight ball. You're starting a couple of steps back. Ask yourself how long you're willing to wait on their phone. Right? Forget about quality. Forget about experience. Forget about how good you are as a lawyer. If someone is not picking up your call immediately, you start off on the wrong foot. And I'm curious, with the different types of options out there, I mean, when does it make sense to have intake in-house versus outsourcing or even hybrid, you know, just from your experience? Intake in-house is always going to be the best. It just is, because those are the folks that know where the office is, that know who the attorneys are, that know um, what it's like to work for AB, you know, Mr. Uh, Johnson, who's the managing attorney of auto accident cases, and he's just wonderful, and you're going to love working with him. You want those things. That's part of the reassurance. You want your intake people to say those things. You want them to be able to tell a claimant who's on the phone, uh, what's your address? Oh, it's Bedford and Flappish. Oh, that's right near uh, Vinny's Pizza, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right near Vinny's Pizza. You want those relationships, okay? Now, you can't have that 24-7. That's more important. The relationship building is is integral to the success, but it doesn't have to be, it's more important to respond first than it is to say, well, I only want Jessica, my best intake person to handle intake calls. And if we just have to get emails and she'll call back when she's available on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m., that's good enough. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. We're gonna make sure Jessica 
and, and Michael and, and Vinny and everyone else who's in our intake department, they're all going to have that skill set of knowing how to communicate and knowing how to build a relationship. So obviously, I'm going to do a better job for my law firm if I could train my people in-house than I am by training an outsourced call center. But your people in-house are not 24-7. And we need to have make sure we have whether you want to call it an insurance policy, whether you want to call it a backup plan. You just need to have a solution for the potential problems, right? That is so important in our industry. I think we're sort of missing the ball a little bit there. You know, I remember being a solo practice because I'm also an attorney who has my own referral practice. And I remember first starting out, going out to dinner with my wife on a Friday night and seeing a a call come in from an unknown number and going, honey, I got to take this call. I'm so sorry, right? That shouldn't be happening. There should be a better solution for that than just calls coming right to me where I have to get up from the movie and take the call, which takes, by the way, 25 seconds to actually get up and walk out of the movie theater and say hello. So uh, I think we have to start acting a little bit more professionally than we're currently doing. So in regards to even outsourcing, let's say to, to a call center, I mean, what are some of the downsides, right? Because someone could say, you know what, I don't have an intake staff. I don't have time to invest in one or train one. I'm just going to outsource this. Where does that really start to fall off? Like, why, why isn't that kind of the, the end all solution? I mean, you're talking right now that some of it's remote, right? And when you get remote staff, especially in this post-COVID world, like I hope I'm not being too confident saying post-COVID world as opposed to COVID world. But when you have remote remote uh, staff, you're going to get the bad reception. You're going to get background noise. You're going to get someone who doesn't know your law firm very well. And, and quite frankly, Michael, it's it's more like this is why your calls, uh, a call center should not be your front end intake, right? Because you have an intake team who hopefully does not have these problems. It's important that if you're going to outsource to a call center, at least you understand that the quality is not going to be as strong as your internal intake unit. Again, though, just be aware. Look into it. Dive a little bit deeper. Listen to the recorded calls, right? Maybe the call center you're with, maybe their abandonment rate is too high. Maybe they're not picking up fast enough. Maybe they're having long hold times. Maybe the call lasted 15 minutes, and it should have lasted three minutes because it's not really a call. Uh, Maybe we didn't give the right information. We didn't train the outsourced call center well enough to provide the appropriate responses to questions. And I think what I don't want anyone to do is to blindly say, hey, you people over there, just handle these calls. There's a lot of training that goes and that gets involved in that. And I think it's important that you spend a little bit of time preparing, if you're going to have human beings handle phone calls, they have to be prepared. Preparation is huge. They can't improvise it. And then let's say even internally at a firm, you you think about it, whether somebody has one person answering the phones or, or an intake staff, oftentimes it seems like these people aren't really set up for success, right? They are oftentimes the lowest paid employees, yet here, here they are. They're the first responders. They're the cover of your book. They are literally, the, the, the a claimant is judging your book, your firm, by your intake specialist, by the first person that picks up. And I'll tell you, because it's not all negative. Some intake specialists are brilliant. They're amazing. I remember personally, when we, when my wife and I moved to the area we live in right now, she had an allergy and I had to find an allergist. And I didn't know any allergists. So I called multiple allergists and one receptionist picked up and I said, can Dr. Levine help my wife with this? And she paused and she said, oh, Dr. Levine's the best. And the way she said that, it didn't matter. Dr. Levine could be made up. Done. I am going to Dr. Levine. No one else is as good as Dr. Levine. So it's actually the rest of the firm quite often that they don't value intake as much as they should. There's a lot of negativity about all the things they do wrong. They're, they're, for many firms, it's not about rewarding when it should be. A lot of lawyers are awful at intake. They don't handle responding to intake well. So what you're going to get a lot, Michael, is intake will have questions. Oh, I have this potential client on the phone. It's not a clear case, but there's a serious injury. And it's something that the, 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 the intake specialist may not be prepared for. And they go reach out to an attorney. And then the attorney says, I'll get back to you. A day, two days later, three days later, four days later. And now the intake specialist is nervous. Do I follow back up with that attorney, with that high powered, much paid, much better than me, much louder, intimidating individual? Do I follow up or I just wait it out? And now here we are leaving money on the table because the attorney isn't taking intake or this lead as seriously as the intake specialist is. So there's definitely a, a disconnect between the intake team and everybody else in the firm. 
so so up until this point, we've been talking about kind of the somewhat of a divide between an intake team and the attorneys. And this is kind of the age old debate. Uh, I, I know you've answered this probably a hundred times, maybe a thousand times. Who should be answering the phones first? You know, because because some firms will say, you know what, it should only be lawyers taking calls. That's the only way we'll do it. Um, what are your thoughts? I strongly believe that the lawyers should be doing lawyerly things um, and that the intake team is your sales team and you can train them to be very effective. However, you walk into a car dealership, you sit down with a salesperson, you feel really good about the deal you might be getting and you tell the salesman, you know what, let me think about this. Let me talk to my spouse and I'll get back to you. The salesperson stops you in your tracks and says, whoa, hold on, hold on. Before you leave, allow me to introduce you to our manager. Now, why is he doing that? Not because the manager is a better salesperson, but because the manager with that title has a little bit more persuasion in trying to get me to hand them a check and they hand me a set of keys. They don't want me leaving because they know there's another dealership right down the block. They know they may not have a second bite at this apple. And I think law firms need to begin to use lawyers in this regard. When an intake specialist is speaking with a claimant, who is hesitant and is ready to hang up that phone, and it's a case that we want, there should be an attorney or team of attorneys that are available to get in the phone, introduce themselves, communicate the benefits, and effectively get them to move forward with the law firm. And if we're not doing that, then we're not doing everything in our power to maximize the return on our marketing investment. Where do you see the legal industry going? Like, even if we were to project, you know, I could say 10 years, but, you know, 10 years seems like a, you know, a distance away. What about even five years? I think that right now there are a lot of aspects to our business that are reliant upon human being hours and human being decisions. And a lot of those, whether it's decisions or those hours, they don't need a person to provide a solution. I'm not the first one to say that the technology is advancing rapidly fast or that we're going to be more technologically advanced three, five years from now. But I will tell you that in looking at our industry, we're not there yet. There, there is a lot of room for improvement. There is a lot of room for faster and more effective solutions. And I think as we begin to open up and consider those solutions, we're going to realize, unfortunately, what we lost in the past, but we're also going to realize how much more potential there is for the future. So I think we're going to start to rely more heavily on tech. I do. I mean, that's not the, the smartest thing I'll say today, but I promise it's probably the most accurate. Yeah. And, and a lot of this even comes back to what we what we started the podcast with and kind of your background, your upbringing. It, it, and much of it really comes back to just excellence in customer service and, and excellence in the client experience, because I think that's really the competitive advantage in where you win and, and whether that's done through having a well-trained intake staff or appropriate leveraging technology and so on. I think that's really the, the, the future and how firms will be able to, to compete. You're right on. You cannot have an entitlement uh, persona and win in business. You can't, you know, I'm a big fan of the Gary V's out there and, and all those guys that are, that are pushing kindness and, and pushing customer service and client experience. I'm a fan. I'm a believer. And, and I do think at the end of the day, while I just told you 30 seconds ago how technology is going to change everything, I will also tell you that we make decisions with our heart a lot. And our heart is impacted by the feeling that somebody else gives to us, whether it's the intake specialist whether it's the attorney. It's as simple as you may not have an update for a client. You might have signed a client. They may have been a client for two and a half years. You may not have an update. But why would you go three or six months without picking up the phone and saying hello, letting them know what's going on, letting them know that you're still working hard, hard for them? Those little touch points go a long way in creating and sustaining a relationship. And I think those folks out there that prioritize that, those folks that are aware of that, they're the ones that are going to get, you know, that are going to move forward with their business. The ones that think that they could just sit back and let things, you know, happen on their own, they're in trouble. I'm telling you they're in trouble. 
you made this post about your experience at this auto dealership about just these guys really just not even getting out of their chairs to to help you and support you. And then there's a bunch of people commenting saying, well, this is a different time and they've got supply constraints and all, all these different things. It was just so puzzling to me because I, I I literally went through this experience uh, recently with, uh, with with the G-Wagon for, for the summit. And it used to be where like you'd message someone, any anybody who works at a car dealership and you said, hey, man, I'm, I'm interested in something, you know. Your phone would ring and you'd get texts every single day, probably for the next six months. It's unbelievable. It's un- I went to no less than four dealerships. One, one phone call. One phone call I got from a dealership after I gave them all my contact information. Nothing to do with supply and demand. It was a terrible experience. Not one of them cared about creating a relationship. It was mind boggling to me. And I, it's going to hurt them. It's, I ended up going with a leasing agent. Literally, I, I did not use any of their, uh, their dealerships. Uh, my wife and I are big relationship people. And if we can create a relationship with you, we're probably going to pay more to stick with you, right? Because we, we trust you. And, and that's so important in any business that you have. You know, my it's funny. My oldest son is 13 years old and he hates change. He hates change. He He's, he's very commi- a very committed person. And there's a pizza place in our neighborhood I don't love. I don't think it's great. He will not change from that pizza place because he's nervous that they're going to go out of business if he goes elsewhere. So he is committed to this pizza. It's the first one he was introduced to. They say hello to him when he goes into the store. And he's not the only one like that. There are folks that are just, they're dedicated to their team because of the relationship that was built, regardless of the quality. That's what's so crazy. Your quality is secondary to all the other stuff, to the relationship building, to the response time, to the touch points. They'll actually, I'll go one step further here, Michael. Imagine a law firm getting a case and only being able to settle it for $25,000 when the client thought it was worth $100,000. Now go back and tell me the history of the relationship with the law firm. If it was a terrible relationship with a few touch points, that client's going to throw his hands up and go, you guys were terrible. You got me only $25,000. I was expecting $100,000. I'm never going to recommend you. Here's my bad review. Now do the complete opposite. Client gets $25,000, but a relationship was built over three years and there have been 50 touch points and emails and they know each other. You know what that client's going to say? Mr. Falkowitz, is this the best you can do? It really is, client. Well, then I trust you. Let's do it. And now you might even get a positive review out of it. Same result, but a different relationship. That's what's happening in the world right now. So Gary, This being the Game Changing Attorney podcast, man, as we come to a close, what does being a game changer mean to you? For me, it's it's the proactive seeking inefficiencies and then obviously looking for solutions before the issues become problems. If you're going to be reactive uh, in in a business or whatever you're doing, you're likely going to be steps behind the leader. And to be a game changer, to be a leader, you have to be proactive in looking for the inefficiencies and the potential inefficiencies. And that, to me, separates the great from the good. 